years, then we haven't even copyrighted our material. We allow people to copy it, to give it away. That's what we want. How about you have 30 seconds to talk about zircon crystals? I'm told that diffusion of helium from zircon crystals is one of the most complicated and subtle arguments ever made in defense of a young Earth. So sure, Eric. Let's attempt to overturn centuries of physics in 30 seconds. On your mark. Get set. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And we just got done talking about the Rate Project, which is fascinating because a group of scientists from the Institute for Creation Research actually did tons of scientific, scientific experiments dispelling the idea that radioactive uh, dating methods can give us the ages that we're looking for as far as the millions of years. Talk about that for a second, Paul. Rate was an acronym for radioisotopes and the age of the Earth which was perhaps prophetic in selectively including only some words to get to the desired title. The project to study radiometric dating included young Earth creation luminaries, Larry Vardaman, Andrew Snelling, Eugene Chafin, John Baumgartner, Steve Austin, Donald DeYoung, Stephen Boyd, Andrew Snelling, and one Russell Humphreys. One of the things they did was measure the, uh, the age of uh, crystals in granites by two different methods. One by the radiometric method where they got the 1.5 billion years and secondly by another reliable method using helium diffusion which gave an age of about 4,000 years. Whoa! And two both, totally different ages from the same from, from the, the same, same rock. rock but also from the same radioactive process. So for both to be correct wow. the only way that they can both be correct is that one of the assumptions is wrong and the only assumption that could be wrong is that the half-life has never changed. Whoa. So in other in other words, the half-life must have changed. The reason why Paul here, and the Rate Project in general, would want to be able to say that half-lives have changed in the past is to attempt to invalidate the entire field of radiometric dating, one of science's most relied upon methods for determining the age of ancient materials. There are many flavors of radiometric dating, from carbon-14 to potassium-argon to uranium-lead and many others, but all measure the ratio of parent isotopes to child isotopes to determine age based on the assumption that the rate of decay has been constant. In over 100 years of study, alpha decaying nuclei rates have proven to remain steady even under extreme changes in external conditions. They just keep ticking, which is why this kind of decay is used for atomic clocks and all international standards for defining a second of time. Unlike nuclear decay, Helium diffusion is known to change by orders of magnitude with even very slight changes in the physical environment, particularly temperature. In fact, the term zircon helium thermochronometry is generally used in the literature to indicate that this system behaves more like a thermometer than a clock. Despite this, the rate team appeared comparent discrepancies between a reliable nuclear decay clock and a highly volatile helium diffusion thermometer misapplied as a clock and declared that the only way that you can rationalize these two things of the crystals producing the right amount of helium for a 6,000 year age but producing radioactivity for a 1.5 billion year age the only factor that can possibly change there is that the half-life of uranium must at some point in the past have gone rapidly out of control much faster than it is today rather than accept millions of recorded observations and a century of uncontradicted predictive power the young Earth creationists hypothesized that not only were rates different in the past, but they were rapidly out of control faster in the past. Such a claim would need to be backed up with extraordinary evidence. At the 5th International Conference on Creationism in August 2003, doctors Humphreys, Austin, Baumgartner, and Snelling claimed to finally have this conclusive evidence with their presentation, Helium Diffusion Rates Support Accelerated Nuclear Decay. While laypeople like Eric Hovind continue to tout these findings as fact, my own foray into the research showed me that very few individuals have the necessary background in chemistry, physics, geology, material science, and math to even evaluate these claims. Two men who are qualified and have independently investigated deeply are Dr. Gary Lachelt, an electrical engineer and also an old earth creationist Christian and contributor to the prominent Reasons to Believe Christian Science Ministry. Thank you, everyone. My name is Gary Lachelt. And Dr. Kevin R. Henneke, a retiree from the University of Kentucky Center for Applied Energy Research, whose Talk Origins essay was foundational on this topic. Link in the description. Thank you very much. I want to greet everybody and say hello. Now, the crystals and so-called granites Paul Taylor were describing came from Fenton Hill, New Mexico, back in the late 1970s and early 1980s. What did they find? And they noted that there was what they considered to be a surprisingly large amount of helium in these crystals. 
Gentry and, and, and his fellow young earth creationists thought that it's unreasonable. They did not believe that helium could be retained by these crystals for billions of years. Okay. But that sheer amount of helium couldn't have accumulated in just 6,000 years. That isn't enough time. And their underlying belief was if nuclear decay rates were accelerated at any time in the past, you could have large amount of decay products in a short period of time. To support this hypothesis, the great team selected Russell Humphreys, who had a physics background, to construct a diffusion model of the system. And they claimed that based upon their modeling, that there's convincing evidence for younger. Now, you two have been challenging these findings for well over a decade, causing Dr. Humphreys to author at least six major revisions and follow-ups to the original work. You were both recently on Steve McRae's channel. Hey, welcome, everybody. Giving nearly four hours of presentations of your critiques. They were fascinating, definitive works going into all the details for those who want them. There's a link in the description to the seemingly innumerable difficulties with the rate study. But my video is in response to Eric's 30-second surface-level overview. Here are my top 10 problems with helium diffusion in zircon crystals rate study. Number 10, misidentifying the rocks. When people get too chummy with me, I like to call them by the wrong name to let them know I don't really care about them. Just as a skateboard would pass through mud, snow, and dry concrete at different rates, as light would pass through air, water, and jello at different rates, it should be no surprise that helium passes through different materials at different rates. Since the purpose of the research was to determine the rate at which helium is diffusing, it would be necessary to know what kind of material it's passing through. If the material is homogeneous, or rather made up of multiple components, and that samples have uniform chemical and physical properties, so that any comparisons are indeed apples to apples. Now, Dr. Humphreys admits that, and I'll read this, measurements of noble gas diffusion in a given type of naturally occurring mineral often show significant differences from site to site caused by variations in composition. Humphreys and his team misidentified the host rocks of the zircons as granodiorite, an indigenous rock that forms in the deep subsurface from magma. But the scientific literature indicates that 70% of Fenton Hill site samples are similar looking but actually metamorphic rocks called gneiss. Calling an igneous rock a metamorphic rock or a metamorphic rock an igneous rock is like calling a frog a reptile. It's just inappropriate. And the shallowest documented Fenton Hill granodorite samples come from depths of over 2,500 meters, not the mere 750 and 1490 meters of Humphreys samples. And what method did Humphreys' team use to identify the rock in their samples? Microscopic? X-ray diffraction? Trace element analysis? No, they were likely... Entirely based on unreliable naked eye observations, including assuming that orthoclase potassium feldspar is always pink. In other words, he described distinguishing between the so-called granites and granodiorites by looking at the number of pink grains and assuming that they were orthoclase. The problem is that orthoclase may be white, clear, gray, and in rare circumstances, yellow and green and other minerals found in igneous and metamorphic rocks may be pink, such as quartz or calcite. The literature clearly indicates that Humphreys and his team sampled zircons from gneiss, which are metamorphic rocks, and not granites, grandiorites, or any other intrusive igneous rocks. Humphreys and his team falsely claimed the Fenton Hill core consisted of homogeneous intrusive rock, which they misnamed Gemes Grandorite, a label he invented violating strict professional geologist governing body rules about nomenclature in published literature. Humphreys admits that he invented the term Hagenes Grandodiorite to describe all of the Precambrian rocks in the Fenton Hill cores. Inventing a new name and implying homogeneity was either erroneous or deceptive, or both. It's totally inappropriate for Dr. Humphreys to name his own rocks and then put these unauthorized and inaccurate names into the literature. This is certainly not the kind of solid footing by which we should feel confident in overturning an entire field of physics. Number 9. Log 10 versus Natural Log This next one involves a subtle, but very important, nuance in the mathematical expression of logarithms. If you don't know, or don't remember, what logs are, let me bring in the Math BFF for the highlights. Hi guys, I'm Nancy, and I'm going to show you logarithms. Logarithms sound a little pretentious, so I'm just going to call them logs. Okay, what if you have a basic log expression like this? What is that? How do you even read that expression? The way you read it is log base 3 of 9. If you're the kind of person who loves to do things in your head, you can just think to yourself, 
3 raised to what power gives me 9? And if you can do it that way, more power to you, you are cooler than the rest of us, and you end up with something like this that's exponential, 3 to the x power equals 9, which is great because all you have to do is figure out what x makes that true. And since, since 3 times 3 equals 9, or 3 squared equals 9, then you can tell that x must be 2. I'm showing you this one because if you don't have a little base given to you, it's going to be 10. The default is 10, it's implied, and I think it's good to go ahead and write it. All you need to do is figure out what x makes this true, what x makes 10 raised to that power equal to 10,000, or 10 to the fourth power equals 10,000. You can tell that that little power x has to be 4 because 10 to the fourth power equals 10,000, so x equals 4. All right, now let me show you natural logs. That's what this ln means. It stands for natural log, so natural log of 1, or ln of 1. What is a natural log? It really is not as hard as it sounds. It's just a special kind of log where the base is e. So ln 1, natural log of 1, is really just log base e of 1. What is e, by the way? It's just a special number in math. It's a constant, and if you put it in your calculator, it'll be some decimal like 2.718 something something and so on forever. But it really is just defined to be the base of the natural log. So you don't really need to understand that. It's just that when you see ln, just know that it means log base e. So I hope that helped you understand logs. I know logs are everyone's favorite. It's okay. You don't have to like math. If you want the whole lesson, I've linked to Nikki's video in the description. But basically what we need to know is that while log and natural log look very similar on the page, they represent very different things. Just like 30 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Fahrenheit look very similar when written out, in one case you'll be looking for a swimming pool, and in the other, you're looking for a shovel. They are not interchangeable. At the time of the rate study, one of the most prominent studies of helium diffusion in zircon was a 1970 paper by Soviet scientist Magomedov. The trouble came when Magomedov's published helium diffusion rates were five orders of magnitude higher than Humphrey's results. Dr. Humphreys and young earth creationist Armitage admit that when the Magomedov data are entered into Dr. Humphreys' dating equations, they give ridiculous ages for these zircons of only decades to centuries. Everyone, including young earth creationists, agree that the Ural Mountains of Russia, the sample location of these zircons, were not still forming between the reigns of Ivan the Terrible and Joseph Stalin. Instead of properly questioning his dating equations, Dr. Humphreys improperly attacks Magomedov's results. Now, instead of questioning his dating equations and methods, Dr. Humphreys assumed that the natural log diffusion data on the Mega Mendoff graph must be incorrect and that the unit should be in log base 10. In order to test this logarithm unit typo theory, Dr. Henke went to great length in recreating Magomedov's results. And when we do this, we find, lo and behold, using natural log, we get the exactly correct value, 58 kilocalories per mole. If we use log base 10, we get the incorrect value because we don't use the conversion factor. So there's no doubt that Mega Mendoff used natural logs. This means there's something wrong with Dr. Humphrey's dating equations. Dr. Humphrey's misinterpretation of Mega Mendoff 1970 is totally unjustified to the point where we could call it uh, a manipulation or even fudging. Number eight, unreliable low temperature measurements. There's really nothing more I can do, and my joints are freezing up. <laughs> Back in 1966, Fechtig and Kalbitzer published a paper looking at argon diffusion in minerals. But they hit upon methodology and mathematics that applies to diffusion science across the board today. It's really the foundation of all of that experimental work. If you look at any of the published literature on these kind of diffusion experiments, this paper is always cited. I think without exception. Through extensive experimentation and modeling, this pair showed that while diffusion at high temperatures is constant and predictable, the rates at low temperatures are inconsistent and unpredictable. Their advice basically was that when you have deviations at low temperature, this is a region where the model is breaking down, that you should rather extrapolate from the high temperature part of the curve. You should focus on the high temperature part of the data because that is where the model is more likely to be valid and ignoring the low temperature anomalies. That is how they recommend, that's best practice for using their method. Even though Humphrey cited Fechtig and Kalbitzer, he ignored their advice and chose to focus exclusively on the non-reliable 
low temperature conditions. This is the iconic graph. That one picture that Humphreys will show over and over that is his vindication. The high temperature data collected is in blue, where the low temperature data is in green. It is only the green data that falls along the line of Humphreys' young Earth model. It's not the majority of the data that agrees with the model. The majority of the data actually has a much higher slope. It's only these four data points. He presents all this data, but really, the argument stands or falls on just four data points. So the reliability of that data needs to be considered. Number seven, assuming temperatures have never changed. Computer, status report. We have the core temperature. Unchanged. As temperature plays such a large role in diffusion, Humphreys recognized that knowledge of the thermal history of the Fenton Hill dig site would be relevant and identified three research papers that had studied the area. Kolstad and McGetchen in 1978, Harrison, Morgan, and Blackwell in 1986, and Sasada in 1989. In short, each identified evidence of, and causes for, massive volcanic and geothermal activity over the history of the location. Lichelt graphed this data over time, showing a billion years of variation here in blue. Despite citing these same sources himself, Humphreys chose to ignore the data and instead took the current temperature and assumed it's been constant throughout history, as shown in yellow. So he basically took today's temperature, let's say 197 degrees at 2.9 kilometers well depth, and treated it as a constant overall time. You would not expect today's high temperature to have been sustained over the past indefinitely. If you try and follow the actual geologic history. Number six, reading the graph the wrong way. Humphreys has defended this massive oversimplification by suggesting that higher temperatures in the past would actually be generous to a secular model, and pointing to this graph from Harrison as evidence. Now this is a problem because Humphreys read the graph backwards. The past is to the left and the more recent to the right. The opposite of how Humphreys interpreted it. Something the creationist finally admitted to. Humphreys has admitted that he made a mistake here. So let's see what he said. He said, I did not read it, the Harrison paper, carefully. I was reading the graph backwards. So he agrees. Despite this fundamental temperature problem, no element to the study has since been retracted. And so evidently, reading a graph forwards or backwards and having temperatures higher or lower is not of any real importance. Number five, it would melt the Earth. The great and the good are gathering towards the planet burn. What for? Fun. In his 2005 book, Thousands Not Millions, young Earth creation physicist Robert DeYoung wrote about Humphrey's rapid decay hypothesis. Calculations show that this much decay of uranium and thorium atoms within a typical rock mass would raise the rock temperature as high as 22,000 degrees Celsius. This temperature is nearly four times hotter than the surface of the sun and would likely vaporize entire rock masses in explosive events. But the crust of the Earth did not melt during the flood period. And that calculation accounts for only one type of decay. Not only would these zircons be destroyed by such heat, but our planet as well. Outside of proposing a miracle cooling event from God, Humphreys has no explanation. DeYoung isn't the only young Earth creationist to point out this heating problem. In a letter to CEN Technical Journal in 2000, Dr. Danny Faulkner, now of Answers in Genesis, co-wrote this. One could hypothesize that radioactivity was sped up as the result of the fall or at the time of the flood, and then later return to normal. But again, this seems like a case of special pleading. If that part of physics has changed, then all of physics has changed. One can suggest that all of physics changed at the time of the fall, but this change is not observable or testable, and would pose immense problems for explaining how the pre-fall world could have functioned. Now those are just a handful of the many criticisms of the rate team research methodology and model formation. But no one can argue with results. The proof is in the pudding, as Paul Taylor says. The experimental results that you then do fit with the creationist view, Man, with the evolutionary view. That is so cool. Humphreys calls it the uniformitarian view, since evolution has nothing to do with geology or radioactivity. But either way, I strongly advocate this philosophy that a scientific model should be judged on its ability to predict future data. So let's round out the list on fitting experimental data. Number four, correcting for method errors, the data matches secular expectations. Very dangerous. He does not expect all of you to live. According to the Ray Group, their follow-up experiment didn't align with old Earth predictions. 
And he made these claims that uniformitarian has totally failed this experimental test, taking into account some of the measurement errors that Dr. Henke identified. If you construct an older model with correct inputs, you can actually have very good agreement between the data. So there's no scientific need to postulate an exotic physics phenomena to explain something that we can explain with ordinary physics. Number three. Humphrey's lab report is missing. You didn't turn in your paperwork last night. He did? I, mean, I no p- p- paperwork? This office is now closed. We know that at some point, the rate team claims to have found four data points that they could fit to their predictions. As the entire claim rests upon these four points, obviously Humphreys would want to document them beyond any shadow of a doubt. However, when they published their final data, There was no lab report from the lab, from the research. Anxious to defend Humphreys, a young Earth creationist acquaintance of Dr. Lachelt, asked for a copy of the lab report, a standard request for any researcher. The only way he would give it to me was if I promised not to give it to you or anyone else without his permission. The lab report exists, but he will not share it. And he's actually suspicious of people who want to see it. And my question is, what's in that lab report? While it is important for scientists and their labs to maintain full transparency with each other for accurate results, the rate group didn't even use their real name when hiring Kenneth Farley's services at the California Institute of Technology. Instead, they posed as Zodiac Mineral and Manufacturing Company. For most secular journals, this would be a serious ethics violation. But apparently, young Earth creationist ethics hold to a lower standard. When Dr. Lachelt contacted Farley in 2005, he would not shed light on the missing lab reports. But he had 13 words to say. I have a strong opinion. These people are totally dishonest. End of story. This raises some concerns about the ethics of the study. It it undermines the credibility of the whole thing. They need to address very basic questions like this regarding transparency of data reporting. If what they really seek is credibility in the eyes of the secular community. Number two. Whole lab experiments are missing. Into these 15 genetically designed super spiders. There's 14. One's missing. Yeah. Huh. According to Humphreys, further experiments were run in the summer and fall of 2002 in an attempt to gather more data. Did these experiments also support the young Earth expectations? They ran several experiments, but the results were unpublished because, in his words, the results were ambiguous. But what does that mean, ambiguous? Presumably, it means it didn't support their hypothesis. They ran experiments. The diffusivities came out lower than they wanted. It didn't support their model. And so, because they think it's ambiguous, they dismiss it. Despite repeated requests, the data from these experiments have not been released to allow others to judge the relevance and ambiguity. And the number one problem with the rate group helium diffusion in zircon crystal studies, all subsequent experiments contradict the creation claim. You are contradicting a sworn statement you previously made to me and signed. I don't know nothing about that. Fortunately, with the march of time and science, we no longer need to rely on Humphrey's data alone. When the rate study was published around 2004 and 2005, very little was known about helium diffusion zircon. Over the course of the last 12, 13 years, several researchers have studied the system. So we know a lot more about helium diffusion zircon today than we did back in 2004. We now have at least nine studies that measure actual activation energies for the helium diffusion in zircon. Eight subsequent studies record observations within the narrow range of values of between 35 and 40 kilocalories per mole. The rate study is the only outlier at an order of magnitude difference of 13.9 kilocalories per mole. So the rate team is placing tremendous significance on just four data points, and it's inconsistent with what everyone else in the field has been publishing. Just four data points in their experiment, which Fedig and Koblitzer say should really be ignored because it's where their model is no longer valid. If experimental data is what we want to be judged upon, then my response is, then why can't we just go to the literature and accept the results of Reiner's 2004, Cherniak 2009, Wolfenstockley 2010, Gunther 2013. All of these papers contradict the helium diffusivity extracted from the low temperature data in the rate experiment. So much of the data in the field in the literature contradicts these four samples from the rate study, and the history behind acquiring that data is now very suspect. 
So are we still creationists based on all that? Great question, Eric. The creationists claim that all rock stars and galaxies in the universe can't be much more than 6,000 years old because too much helium was found in zircon crystals from geothermal test wells in New Mexico. Too much helium can't account for it. Therefore, every rock star and galaxy in the universe must be about 6,000 years old. Problem, though, is that in 6,000 years, you wouldn't have any helium to begin with. Well, that's explained because in addition to that, nuclear decay rates were accelerated by a factor of around half a billion to count for the helium. But then if you have that, you would have so much heat, it would melt the Earth. But that was prevented because there was some cosmic cooling event that kept the Earth from melting from the intense radiation. In contrast, my fantastic theory and scenario is basically this, that in constructing a diffusion model, I could just take what's published in the literature, really considering everything that happens from the Cambrian up to the Holocene, and not just focusing on one volcanic event. Which one is straightforward? Which one is a fantastic theory? Well, thank you, Drs. Hanke and Lachelt, and host Steve McRae, for allowing me to lift your voices and for subsequently fact-checking this video. If you want to read their papers or watch their full detailed presentations on this topic far beyond this summary, please check out the links in the video description. This video has been four months in the making. It's a complicated topic, so thanks for watching through. I hope you learned something, and I hope it's valuable to some of you in evaluating creation claims. I want to say a huge thank you once again to all my Patreon supporters. Continued support there really does make it possible for me to keep doing videos, so thanks so much. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe, leave me a comment, and check out the other videos. Coming soon, Genesis Paradise Lost. Until next time, thanks for watching. Later.